guys, how's it going? So today I get the privilege of introducing one of my best friends here at uh, Greenville and Jonah Wilson speaking today. He's a two-year member of GSGA's student outreach, so he plans all the trips for students to go on, give back to communities, and serve. So without further ado, let's welcome Jonah Wilson. It is, yeah. How's this sound? Works a little better, doesn't it? All right. Well, thanks for bearing with me here. But before I get started too far, I need a volunteer, and I need a brave soul. I need you to volunteer without knowing what you're going to volunteer for. We have one quick volunteer. You're the first one. Okay. Brand, stand up with me. Come up here. Now, you need to sit right here. You're only moving up a few rows. I need you to hang tight right there for me, okay? We'll come back to you here in a little while. But as we think about our volunteer here, how we're going about our lives here in the second last week of school, I want us to think about ways that we follow in our lives. Maybe it's like our volunteer who follows behind the steps of someone else. Maybe you follow when you don't know where you're going. You hop in the car, you follow somebody who knows where they're going, and you follow the direction. Maybe you follow the example of someone else when they are doing something you don't know how to do. They're teaching you how to do something. There's so many different ways that we follow in our lives. I think back to a time early in my life when I followed one of my friends and some of my family. I was in my room at home one day, and my parents came into my room, and they said, hey, we're gonna take a little trip, and we're gonna go to a place called Indiana Beach. And Indiana Beach was a place a couple, mi- a couple hours from my house, a small amusement park in Indiana, where there's some small uh, roller coasters and rides, there's some water slides and different games and things like that. So I was excited to go on this trip, and they told me I could bring one friend. So I chose my friend, his name was AJ, and we went on this trip, and we got there early in the morning, and we started riding the rides, playing the different games, but in between the rides, in between the games, there was this one particular ride that my parents and AJ kept leading me to. They said they wanted to ride this one. Here's a picture of that ride. It's a nasty little contraption right there on the edge of the water. And for me, I did not want any part of this. The whole day I was resisting, saying, no, no, let's do this one instead. Let's do this one. And after I had made all the suggestions to get around going on this ride, they eventually said they were going with or without me. And so reluctantly, I caved to the peer pressure. I got on this ride against my better judgment. So we hopped on. As you can see there, it's right along the water. And so we got in and got going. And it was moving pretty slowly at first going around in the circle. So I thought, okay, this isn't too bad. But as it got faster, not only did it speed up, but it also began to elevate. You can see it tilt a little bit there. And then the seat that you were in would start to move side to side and move up and down. And after a few rotations around, the next thing I knew, I was leaning over the rail in front of me, spilling out my breakfast onto that deck below and onto my friend AJ and I. My stomach typically didn't work very well with, especially rides that spun like that, even though I enjoyed all the others. And so a few spins later, it it took for the the operator to actually realize what was happening. So then he eventually stopped it, it lowered down, I was able to get off and then make the humiliating walk all the way through the park with nasty clothes as well, to be, be able to eventually go change. Here, when I followed that day at Indiana Beach, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I didn't know that that was going to happen. And if I did know that that was going to happen, there's no chance that I would have been on that ride. And today I want to take a look at a passage in Scripture that we may be familiar with, that we have, for those who have grown up in the church, maybe heard about in songs or in rhymes or in stories. 
but a passage in which we see people follow for not the best on the surface reasons. It doesn't seem logical. It doesn't seem like it makes sense for these people to follow. We see some of the first disciples following Jesus in Mark chapter 1. If you follow along with me, I just want to take take a look at five short verses. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew coming, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. See, in many of the the stories in the Gospels, we get different bits of information in different Gospels. And this is an example of one of those instances. We see this same, very similar recollection of what happened in the book of Matthew in chapter 4. But then we also get a little bit more information about what happens around this time of the disciples first following Jesus in the Gospel of John as well. And in John chapter 1, we get a little bit more background of what's going on here. Now, this is the time in Jesus' ministry that is before it's really kicked off, before he's really gotten into the, the meat of what he's doing. So he had been tempted, he had been baptized by John the Baptist, but he hadn't done any miracles yet. People weren't fully understanding, comprehending, and observing the power that Jesus held. And so then we get this information in John chapter 1, starting in verse 35. It says, the next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And this is John the Baptist. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And just a few short verses later, we see that one of those two disciples is a common denominator in these two stories. One of these two disciples is Andrew, one of the first people who heard that call of Jesus. Now, many people believe that Andrew may have heard this and then shared this news before Jesus called them to follow with his brother, with Simon, who we better know often as Peter. Maybe he even shared it with John and James as well as they were all fishing together. But what we do know is even despite this information, this title that John the Baptist bestows upon Jesus, there's not much information that the disciples are going on when they make the decision to leave their nets behind and to leave and follow Jesus. Leaving the certainty and the comfort and the consistency of their life before for a life of unknown, a life of uncertainty. And while these weren't the most wealthy men in the world, not the most acclaimed or socially relevant people, they were average men and they had a job that would provide for them. As fishermen, they would be able to always have fish there to to catch and then always have people who would buy the fish when they caught it, have a stable living. But they choose to leave those things behind and pick up the call of Jesus instead. Early church father, St. Jerome, writes about this, and he says that the, the, the disciples left their father of the flesh to follow the father of the spirit. They did not leave a father, they found a father. And I wonder, as I think about when the disciples made that decision to drop down their nets and follow, did they know this? Did they know the weight, the magnitude of what they were doing? I don't know. That's all the information that we get from the text. But I think what they did know is that they were leaving what they knew and what was certain for something that was incredibly uncertain. And so I want to consider today what happens when we follow Jesus? How do we change? How are our lives transformed? What do we gain when we follow Jesus? And I believe when we consider this, we see two different pieces illustrated here by the disciples, that we get a new look and a new heart. And it's easy to take a look at this passage and just assume that as people who are in a Christian institution that are here in chapel, that we are already past this point. That we have already accepted the call. We've already laid down our nets, so to speak. But I believe there's things that we can still learn from this text. 
See, when the disciples chose to follow Jesus, it wasn't just walking behind him and following in his footsteps. Truly following Jesus. And when the call of Jesus is offered to different people, when he says, follow me, or when he says, come behind me, or when he calls out to them, it isn't just a copycat where he wants them to act like him or maybe walk in the same places that he walks, but he is calling them to a true life of discipleship. A life that is totally changed. I would call it a reorientation of their life. Introducing a piece that was not present before and and totally reorienting themselves after that piece of their lives. And we see that the disciples take what they were doing and leave that behind and take up something new. Which happens when we choose to follow someone. We leave behind the old and take up the new. Not everything, but some. We leave behind some things and take up new. As just a few weeks ago, here in chapel, our preacher in residence, Pastor David Hawkins, reminded us, you can tell how someone is changed based on who they follow. And we see here that the disciples had that first moment of change occur when they chose to follow Jesus. But it didn't end right there. It was a continual decision. And for each of us, it is a continual decision to continually choose to follow Jesus in all we do. And when we do that, we have that new look. We have a difference about us that other people can see. And as Jesus calls these men, he doesn't call people who are of a high social status or rich or prominent. He calls people who are fairly ordinary. And it also isn't as if they're people who are poor and don't have any other option and and may just say, well, what do I have to lose? But people who did have some consistency in their lives, and they choose to give that up and follow him. And we see that reminds us that We don't have to attain a certain status. We don't have to do certain things in order to be able to be open to that call of Jesus. But that call is open for all people, regardless of their backgrounds or situations. All that we do need to have is a desire to reorient ourselves to Jesus, to place him at the center of our lives. I think back to a conversation I just had a few days ago with my great-grandfather, and I'm very grateful to have a relationship with him and another great grandparent as well throughout my life. I love talking to him, but it always seems like when I talk with him, a conversation that takes five minutes stretches on to about 35 or 40 minutes. Maybe you experienced that with some of your grandparents as well, but the other day I was talking to him, and while that happened, I enjoyed hearing a story that he told me. And I'm amazed at his memory as he thinks back so far in his life. But he was telling me something that happened over 50 years ago. And he was talking about how he was in his house one day, and he went to sit down on his bed, and at this point he had smoked for years in his life. And so he went down, he sat on his bed, and went to light a cigarette. And he was having a hard time breathing. The time went on a little bit, and it wasn't improving, it was actually getting a lot worse, and so he was taken to the hospital, and they checked him out, and they found that it was actually just a case of the flu. It was a bad case of the flu. And so he was there recovering, and a couple days after, he had first gotten there, he went to do what he'd done so many times before. He went to light another cigarette, but he looked over to his side, and he had a roommate at that time in the hospital, and this man had an oxygen tank. And so he knew, okay, I'm not going to smoke here in the room with an oxygen tank so close, but he also realized something, not just that obviously that's going to be a bad idea, but that this is kind of a wake-up call for him. You see him here. He's the man on your right side. And that's the person that I know. And I know the person who did this 50 years ago is a much different person in many ways. But from that point on, this was something that just kind of sparked his decision. He decided from that day forward he wasn't going to smoke anymore. And pretty drastically, he gave... He got rid of all of his cigarettes, and he chose to never smoke again. And from that day forward to to this day, over 50 years later, he hasn't smoked a cigarette in his life. See, in one area, he had this reorientation, this resetting of himself to a new way and a new standard. 
And he chose to live to that for the rest of his life. And as we think about our call from Jesus to follow him, it's a total reorientation. And he calls us to something drastic, something that for the disciples to hear could have been pretty challenging. He calls them to be fishers of people. And for us, especially those of us who have grown up in the church, we hear that and we're familiar with that, and at least I am. We're familiar that that means talking to others about Jesus, to make disciples. But for them, what would they have thought when they heard this phrase, I will make you fishers of people? Well, there's actually two other spots that we may not see much in Scripture that reference the same type of phrase of being fishers of people. But they both come in the prophets, one in the book of Jeremiah and one in the book of Habakkuk. But they're used in a very different way. In each of those instances, this phrase, fishers of people, is used not to bring about this idea of Jesus and his followers, but to bring about this idea of judgment. It's something that's used as an analogy to speak about the ways that people who have turned their backs on God, who have turned away from him and spoken against God, could be judged. But here we see Jesus totally flip that understanding on its head. And instead of being fishers of people, something that brings about judgment on individuals, being fishers of people is something that calls people out of that judgment. It's something that projects and professes that good news into the lives of other people so that they can see that and be transformed. We have that new look that we get when we choose to trust Jesus. But that new look, that appearance, is something that is sparked from something deeper inside of us. It comes from a change in our hearts. And when we have a new heart, it's something that comes from a decision of ourself. I remember singing a song about this passage, and it went, I will make you fishers of people, fishers of people, fishers of people. And I remember seeing that so many times in Sunday school I was growing, as I was growing up as a young kid. But that song continues that verse and then responds, and the response to it is, if you follow me. And while that's a children's song that I've known for years, it expresses an important truth, that when we follow Jesus, he doesn't force us to follow him. He doesn't superimpose on us and make us do something that he wants. No, we have to choose to follow Jesus. It's a conditional statement that we have to make that decision. And when we see other parts of Scripture that speak about following Jesus, we see the same type of choice involved, the will of the individual. In Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35, it says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, this is Jesus, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. There's a clear decision on the part of the individual that they have to make that decision to choose to follow Christ. Because truly following someone means not just going behind them or walking in their footsteps, but it means modeling our lives after them. To be a disciple of Jesus, we model our lives after him. And I believe one of these disciples that we read about here in the book of Mark provides us a pretty interesting story, an interesting picture of what it can look like to follow Jesus. That's the man we see referred to as Simon. We may know him as Simon Peter or Peter. And Peter had this this up and down relationship with Jesus. There were times when Jesus praised him, commended him for the things that he was doing, and encouraged him. But there was also times that Jesus rebuked him about as strongly as he rebukes anyone else in the Bible, saying, get away from me, Satan. And and Peter was one of these men who initially accepted this call. Now, one of the most common or popular stories that we may know about Peter comes at a time when it was also one of those valleys, one of the low points in his life. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, after he had told Peter that he would deny him three times, Peter went and did exactly that. Denied Jesus three times. I think it's easy for us to look at Peter and his example and look down upon him or be quick to judge him and think, well, if we were in his shoes, if we had been there to touch Jesus, to speak face to face to Jesus, to walk alongside of Jesus, there's no way that we 
would deny the name. There's no way that we would deny to be, of being a follower of Jesus. How could he do that? But I would encourage us this morning that before we become too quick to judge Peter, we assess our own lives and our own hearts. Because I believe that there's ways that from time to time, each of us can look the part of following Jesus, and yet our hearts may be in a different spot. See, when Peter was truly tested, although he looked like a follower of Jesus and people thought that he was, when he was truly tested, his heart in that moment was revealed. It was revealed when he rejected being a follower of Jesus, when he denied that fact. And how often in our lives do we do things that make us look like we are following Jesus? I mean, we're all here in chapel right now. We come to things like chapel, or we go to weekly church, or we go to a Bible study, or we go to Vespers, or we go to Alpha, we go to a small group, we do our own personal devotions. We do so many things that give off that appearance of being holy, of following Jesus. But how often do we do those things that make us appear like we're following Jesus? when our hearts may not be in it. And by no means do I speak against those things and say that they're bad by any means. But what I do mean is that it's possible for us to do all those things and to give the appearance of being perfectly right with God and holy and pursuing Him while not truly being there in our hearts. Like Peter, we can follow Christ with our outward appearance from time to time, but in our hearts not be with him in every moment. And I say this not out of any place of perfection by any means. This is something I struggle with every day of my life, especially here at Greenville University. As a ministry student, I go into classes, whether it's a philosophy class or a theology class or a Bible class of some kind, and there's this constant balance between how do I balance what I'm doing and do it in such a way that I'm glorifying God, that I'm furthering my relationship with Him, with also the fact that there's this temptation that each thing I say could also contribute to the way people view me. Elevating my status or social image from other people in the class, whether it's from professors or students. It can be discouraging to think about those times. But I believe even when we look to the example of Simon Peter, we have hope. And even though Peter denied Jesus in one of the most blatant ways possible, three times, right after Jesus told him what would happen, and his story didn't end there. Later, just a few books of the Bible later, in the book of Acts, we see in chapter one, Peter is one of the leaders of the disciples, that he's one of the people who is being firm for others, encouraging them to follow this call that Jesus had called them to. A few chapters later in Acts chapter 4, he comes up with John before the high priests, and he testifies to the things that he believes. He testifies to what Jesus has done and what he is going to do, that he was his living, living his life for Jesus. The same man who denied him becomes one of the pillars of our early church. I believe we can have confidence in knowing that even if we fail to truly follow Jesus with our hearts from time to time, hope is not lost. Our story doesn't end there either. But we can have confidence in looking at a story like Peter's, that despite the uncertainty involved, despite the things that we may do or say, we have a chance to continue to follow Jesus in the future. I asked you really earlier to think about a time you followed in your lives. Now we had our willing volunteer here after about two seconds after I asked for the volunteer. All you had to do was sit up in the front row of chapel, either the worst seat in the house or the best seat in the house, depending on how you view it. But all you had to do was sit right there. You didn't know what was gonna happen. Okay? That's all I'm gonna ask you to do. And here is a Joe's card just for playing along and being a good sport. See, it was worth it for you to just move up three rows. That's all it took. And for us, as we think about the call of Jesus, there's uncertainty involved, yes. 
Each moment of the day, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what we may be called to do. We don't know how we may be called or led by the Holy Spirit to be a witness for our Savior, Jesus Christ. And while it was much easier to move up three rows and receive the reward, we know that it will be worth it for us as well. We can have confidence in following Jesus despite what we may be going through, despite the uncertainty involved. And we can look to the disciples that just as they did not shy away from that uncertainty and they laid down their nets and they followed Jesus, neither should we let any uncertainty stop us from following Jesus every step of the way. The uncertainty was worth it for them and I believe it's worth it for us as well. May we follow their example in every moment of our lives. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we praise you for this time to gather. We praise you for your goodness and for the call that you give to each one of us to be fishers of people. May we respond to that call and be faithful to you in all that we are doing in our lives as we go in this last week of classes and even beyond. May you be glorified in the ways that we are disciples of you. In Jesus' name, amen.